Our next speaker is probably known to most of you. Peter Reinhardt is one of the most well-known, respected artisan bakers in America. He's the author of 10 books, including The Bread Baker's Apprentice and Peter Reinhardt's Whole Grain Breads. He teaches courses on baking and food culture at Johnson and Wales. And we are very lucky to have you here to uh, give us a demo. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being here, Peter. Thank you. Thanks so much. So you, you've had a chance to taste, some of you have had a chance to taste two of the breads, the two breads that are in your packet, the two recipes, which are, uh, which are recipes that out of a new book just came out three weeks ago. So, so, and I actually brought a few copies with me. If anybody wants to pick one up, grab me later. But, um, uh, but it's so new, and, and when I started writing it two years ago, the whole notion of sprouted grain flour was so new that I was worried that, that when the book came out, there wouldn't be any supply of the ingredients for anybody, because you know it's, it's very frustrating to read a book about an idea and not be able to get the ingredients to do anything with it. But the indications were that it was picking up momentum, it was starting to get some traction, and my hope was, was that it would tip over just at about the same time that the book came out. And lo and behold, I think it has. Um, you know, as I arrived here today, uh, or actually on my way to the conference, uh, uh, somebody sent me an article that uh, I'm going to quote from in a minute, uh, pr produced by one of our sponsors, Ardent Mills, you know, largest miller in the country, doing, they're getting into sprouted flour. Uh, uh, Bay State Milling is now getting into sprouted flour. King Arthur uh, Flour has kicked up their, their, their production of sprouted flour. So, and for me, this is kind of an interesting sort of full circle because I had my first restaurant here in Boston 40, over 40 years ago in, on Mass Ave, 30 Mass Ave, right at Beacon Street, for those who are local. Um, and it was called Route One Cafe. And, and Root was spelled R-O-O-T, and our logo was a carrot. And, um, and it was at one of the early, early vegetarian kind of hippie. It was even before Moosewood. We were pre-Moosewood. And, and we did also, and, and one of the interesting things that we did in exploring at that time, because I was like 21 years old, and we were just kind of on an adventure. So we were trying to learn everything we could about food. And a few blocks away from our restaurant, we, we stumbled upon a place called the Hippocrates Health Institute run by Dr. Ann Wigmore. I see some nods there. You know, Ann Wigmore is really the kind of the godmother of the sprouting movement in America. And her whole thing was, you know, we could, we could feed the world, we could save the world if everybody would just sprout beans and, and, and grains and grow wheatgrass and uh, it's the power food of the future. And so we all, you know, we all bought in and thought, yeah, in about three years, we could just turn the whole world around on this. Um, and we incorporated, we did sprouts, and I still, for, for the 40 years since, I continue to make sprouts at home and work them into my you know, salads and things like that. We mostly lentil sprouts and mung bean sprouts. And every once in a while, we plant some wheatgrass and grind it into chlorophyll. Uh, and, and we've seen this sort of like this little, little bit of sprouting uh, working in the raw food movement. And it, it's there. It's, it's never gone away, but it never really exploded. Um, and I moved on to many other things and got into baking and uh, went on my own journey and uh, n never really thought much about the full implications other than the fact that deep down in my heart, I had this, this strong intuition that, that there's something powerful and magical about the idea of sprouting any kind of seeds. And, um, and then I got a call from Joe Lindley, who was the miller uh, in North Carolina, who, who, who his mill is uh, one of the contract mills for King Arthur Flour and they do all the organic, any King Arthur organic flour comes from Lindley Mill, um, not too far from, uh, two hours from where I live in Charlotte. And he, this was about five years ago, he called me, he says, listen, I want you to try something, I'm onto something here, and I just need you to kind of test it and tell me, am I crazy, but I think I've just stumbled upon a, a, the best flour I've ever used. And I said, really? And so he sent it to me, and, I, and he explained to me what it was. He said, I, I sprout the wheat, I dry it, I grind it into flour, and I, and I use it just like flour, but it has a totally different taste and, and profile. And I went, oh, that's really cool. Now, I had known, uh, again, sort of backtracking, I had a, uh, a bakery in Santa Rosa back in the early eight, in mid, mid to late 80s, um, and it was just up the road from another large bakery in Roner Park called Alvarado Street Bakery. And Alvarado Street was, a, was, was the, one of the two large 
bakeries using a sprouted pulp or sprouted mash technique, where they sprout the wheat, same idea, sprout it, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the sprouting process in a minute, but they sprouted it, and then instead of drying it and grinding it into flour, their technique, just as Ezekiel bread does the same technique, they run it through kind of like a meat grinder and grind it into a pulp, um, and then add that into the mixer along with other ingredients, including some vital wheat gluten, um, to, and if any, if those who have read the New Yorker you know, Spectre article that we talked about earlier today, they know that you know, wheat, wheat gluten was sort of the magic ingredient for all that. Well, that bread was developed in the early 1980s by Alvarado Street, but prior to that, um, the Justo flour company in San Francisco uh, was making bread like that in the 1950s. And then later on in LA, um, the, the uh, sort of the founder of what became Ezekiel Bread was making it in his bakery in LA. So this concept's been using sprouted wheat to make bread, it goes back at least 60 years, maybe 70 years now. So it's not new, but it's still sort of niche. And, and it wasn't, and, but Alvarado Street was selling a lot of bread. They were up to about, when I left California to move east, they were up to 25 to 30,000 loaves a day at their bakery. At that time, they were the largest producer of organic uh, wheat bread. And they, but they didn't call it bread made from flour. It says right on the label, made without flour, because the wheat never returned back into flour. Ezekiel bread got a big boost in the late 90s uh, when the Atkins and South Beach you know, phase came through and, and uh, of course, got everybody who was doing it off of bread at the beginning, but then with the promise that if you do well during phase one, you can get back into bread later. But if you start eating bread again, uh, use something like Ezekiel bread. Man, Ezekiel bread spiked like crazy. And now I think they're the largest producer, and they've done very well. So those are, that's a whole style. And now, we're, and now other bakeries around the country are, are um, starting to use it. I think, if I'm not mistaken, my local Panera is doing, and we were talking to Tom Gumpel earlier, who's from Panera, that they're using sprouted, the sprouted mash or pulp method in some of their breads. So it's a very viable method. It's been around for a long time. So, I, so having this bakery down the road for me confirmed uh, way back in the, you know, in the 80s that sprouting wheat is a viable way to make bread. But I, nobody ever believed that, those of us in the artists and bread movement, we all believed that once you sprouted wheat, it no longer really was going to be good for bread making because it would be, quote, damaged. The starches would be too damaged by the enzyme activity that would make the, 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 anything that you produce from that um, too weak to be able to produce a good gluten network so that, that, so that you theoretically would have to add more gluten back into it to make it work. And it does work. It makes great bread. So the idea of making taking flour and turning it into bread without having to add wheat gluten to it, because this is what Joe Lindley said. He says, I'm doing it without gluten. I'm just doing it with, just with the flour alone. Um, you know, that really intrigued me. And so he, I started playing with it. And you know, I made a loaf just exactly like the loaf you had out there the first time. Uh, it was just a real basic flour, water, salt, and yeast, just commercial yeast, very short rise, about a 90-minute first rise. Uh, shaped it, 60 minutes second rise, baked it, and it was like the best wheat bread I've ever made. It didn't taste like whole wheat bread at all to me. It tasted almost like a blend of half white flour, half wheat flour. It didn't have the bitter tones of, of whole wheat, didn't have the heaviness, and it was light. It just felt lighter. And the other remarkable thing about it was, was that it took a lot of water. I mean, normally, I, I, in, in a good whole wheat bread, you would use 75 to 80 percent water and now some artists and bakers will put 90% water to flour. When we say percentages, it's always a ratio against the flour. Um, and and, and they're bakers that can push that much water into their breads because they're used to handling wet doughs. But this one starts at 90%. And I've made some versions of this with 100%, equal amount water to flour by weight. Uh, because in the drying process, it, it dries it even drier than the original wheat berries so that it really sucks up the water later on. So all these were just kind of interesting things. And uh, then I, I got involved in a local pizzeria down in Charlotte where they asked me to develop the, their doughs for them. So I said, well, let's put in a, uh, a whole grain dough. And, um, and so we made one using the sprouted grain. And in the meantime, Joe Lindley had come up with five, another blend. He said of five gluten-free um, grains that he sprouted. He calls it his ancient grain blend. It's buckwheat, millet, sorghum, um, um, sorghum, uh, uh, what, what am I forgetting? No, quinoa. quinoa and amaranth. Thank you. Thank you. You, you jogged it loose. Um, and he would sprout those, dry them, and make his own separate blend. And so we, then we created uh, a gluten-free pizza dough 
using that blend, and it worked. And so there, there was a good example of making a totally gluten-free product without, with, with a sprouted product, without having to add a lot of like uh, starches like rice flour and things like that. So, so um, I started to, to really get into it and realized we were onto something. And then one thing led to another and I started to get deeper into it and wrote about it. And I met some people in um, uh, Alabama, Kilpatrick, Alabama, Peggy and uh, Jeff Sutton, who has a, who have a company called To Your Health. And so I brought some of their stuff here because I used their their sprouted grain, because they had, they had gotten into their sprouted thing almost at the same time as Joe Lindley, uh, actually a little earlier, because she was making it in her home garage just for herself, then making little products to sell at a farm market. And then people said, said, can you make some extra flour for me? And before she knew it, she built the business up to now they're making about 12,000 pounds of flour a day. Um, and, um, and they have about 25 or so different kinds of grains and beans that they're sprouting and drying. So I consider, like Peggy, I, 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 she was like a sprouter in, in her heart who had to mill it. So she had to learn milling to do the sprouting. Joe was a miller who kind of stumbled into sprouting. So I consider them kind of getting to the same place in two different ways. But between them, they're producing pretty much most of the organic sprouted flour now in America. Uh, there's a place in uh, Vancouver called One Degree that is doing organic wheat. Um, there's not that much, there's not that much supply. So when I, when I, when I ran into um, uh, Jay from, from uh, Bay State Milling at, at a recent conference, I found out that Bay State's now getting into sprouted flour. I was amazed, and, and uh, then Art Mills is getting into it. So it's happening, it's all starting to happen. And the only difference really is, I think, between uh, with the larger mills, is there's not enough of the organic flour out there to meet their needs, so they're using conventional wheat, uh, you know, flour to do it. Uh, and, I've play, and I've made some doughs with that, and it performs exactly the same. So that's a little, you know, sort of background on all this. I'm gonna start a dough here, and then we'll stop and talk a little bit about some of the nutritional benefits. Um, I was just up at King Arthur recently, and of course they have, because, because Joe Lindley mills for them, they already have that, and they're selling the sprouted wheat flour. Uh, now they're starting to sell it in their own bags, in the King Arthur bags. And uh, they, they mentioned to me when I was up there that they're getting ready to increase production dramatically as well. Everybody's seeing that this is coming. So I, I consider it an idea whose time has come, and I was just glad to get on the wave you know, at the front end because I get to brag about them. Um, so, so this dough, I'm just gonna make this one dough because I want you to see some interesting properties about it, and then we'll talk more about it. So this is what the bread that you were tasting earlier looked like. It's just, it, we didn't get any real steam on it, so it didn't shine up. Uh, and I'll cut the rest of this up for anyone who wants to try it. So in the bowl, I have some uh, sprouted wheat flour, and I used, um, uh, this is the Lindley flour. He calls it super sprout. In fact, I'll pass this around. You can come down and grab this and just sort of move it around. And then I'll pass all these. So you guys can sort of move, just take them around. There's some white wheat, there's some red wheat, there's some corn grits, and some corn meal. And the corn grits and the corn meal are the exact same product, just ground differently. Um, and you can, you can, if you want to pull some out of the bag, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead and take this one. And here's, the, here's this white wheat. Um, the white wheat is a new product, but now I notice that Arden Mills is planning to get into it primarily at the white wheat side. Uh, uh, the Suttons are mostly selling the red, Joe Lindley mostly the red, the hard red wheat. Uh, so, but in this one, I put, I put half and half, this dough. And the one that you're tasting was about 25% uh, white wheat and 75% uh, uh, red wheat, just because I had both to play with and I wanted to, and I thought it, it, it gave a nice, you can't really tell the difference in the bread, but you can see the difference when you have them side by side. So I've got a little white and a little red, a little bit of instant yeast, and some salt. It's very simple. Now, this could be done, and would probably even be better for you if it was done with sourdough. Now I'm really convinced after the last presentation. And it can be, and in, in the book we, we have you know, the sourdough applications. Uh, but for me, what was the sort of the clincher is, is that, um, is that it tastes really good without using any of the tricks that artisan bakers have to use to make wheat taste good. I always tell my students that, uh, I'm gonna pour the water in while I talk. This should be the right measured amount of water, but if it isn't, I've got some extra here, and if it's too much, then I'm in trouble. Um, I, I, I do a nine-day course on bread baking at Johnson & Wales, and we always start off by telling the students that, uh, the, that I, I tell them that you're, you have a mission during these nine days while you're baking bread, and it's the baker's mission, and the baker's mission is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain. 
Uh, but simple breads like this, where there's not a lot of embellishments, there's no sugars and oils and all this other stuff, it's all about the grain. And your job is to evoke the potential flavor trap in this tasteless flour. And you're going to do it by learning all of the tricks of the baker's trade. And, and uh, a lot of these tricks include things like pre-ferments, or soaking the grain ahead of time, or sponges, or overnight fermentation, slow, long fermentation, that allows the, um, the enzymes in, that are latent in the flour to begin to break apart the starches, release some of the natural sugars that are in there, to unwind them, basically, and re release flavor, so that in the end, you get a much prettier loaf, you get better caramelization in the crust, because in the end, you're really transforming this dough into bread, so and you're transforming it by caramelizing the crust, uh, gelatinizing the starches, and coagulating the proteins. So bread is all about transformation of ingredients you know, on this journey from wheat to eat. And, um, and so that's what they have to do, and they, they learn these tricks, because if they make a bread like I'm doing here without doing those tricks, it's a pretty average or boring bread. It's not going to be a bad bread. It's just not a good bread. It's just so-so. It's, just um, it's the bread that I grew up with. Um, but the last 20 years, the whole bread paradigm in America has changed so much that people expect great bread when they go to restaurants, and they can, or, or if they live near a bakery, they, can, they, they expect great bread, even from the supermarket. Um, so things have really changed dramatically in that regard. And, and it's happened because bakers learned all of these techniques that were uh, you know, developed by European bakers before them and, and kind of passed on to us. Um, so with this bread, we don't have to do all that. I found that I could get the wheat the full potential of the wheat will come out with just about you know, a very minimal amount of fermentation. Um, why? And I, again, I had to keep asking the why question. And I think the answer is essentially that the sprouting does the work for you. It, it preconditions the grain without damaging the gluten, without damaging the, uh, the starches, and, you know, to, to, so that it can still make bread. Uh, but, it, but by this sprouting or germinating process, the, the flour is really primed and ready to go in much the same way that, uh, that Marco's you know, sourdough bread that he just, the flour that he just invented uh, is ready to go and add, you know, when you add all the other ingredients, it's ready to make bread. This is ready to make bread. I, did you, you all, those of you had a taste, did, you, did, you, did it taste good to you? I mean, did it taste sweet? Did you notice the sweetness in there? So, so what's important to know is, is that there was, no, there was no sugar added to that, no sweeteners. It was naturally sweet, and that was just the wheat itself that was naturally sweet. Now, this dough that I made with 90% hydration is a very wet, gloppy dough. I haven't kneaded it very much. I just stirred it. It'll take five to 10 minutes for the gluten to really develop. So, and what I've been, one of the other tricks that we've sort of learned along the way is, is to use minimal mixing in order to get the best, let's say, to, to oxidize the dough less, and oxidation will kind of oxidate out some of the flavor. So minimal mixing actually will give subtle flavor improvement. So that's all the, meat, the actual kneading I'm going to do. I'm going to put, I'm just using a little spray so it doesn't stick to this counter. Usually I'll just rub a little oil. And I'm going to put this dough here. And I want you to just see some of the other changes and transformations that it goes through while we're talking. Um, right now this dough's a little too wet for me to knead anyway, without it getting all over my hands. But what I can do is put some water or oil on my hands and touch it. And then when my hands are wet, the dough won't stick. Wet dough won't stick to wet hands. It took me 20 years of baking to figure that out. <laughs> I, heard, I heard, actually, I heard Beth, um, with Beth from, uh, from the Gluten-Free Pantry, where I forget Beth's last name. She did a I was at a demo that she was doing, and she had this wet, gloppy, gluten-free dough, and she did that. And I went, it was like a light went off. I'm like, wow, how, how did I not know that? And it's changed my baking totally. But you can see that right now, this dough is too young to do anything. There's no gluten structure. There's nothing. But what I am going to do with wet hands is just kind of stretch it and fold it. And every time I stretch and fold it, it's going to develop a little bit more. It's going to take the place of about 60 seconds or so of kneading. Look at that. Just with one stretch and fold, the dough's already changed. We're going to cover that. Do a little switch out later. And, um, no, no, we're just going to just let it do it its own. I'm just going to cover it so it doesn't dry out and get a skin while we talk a little bit about the nutritional side. So that while this dough is sitting here, the gluten is developing. You know, we always thought that mixing is what made, develops the gluten. Mixing doesn't actually develop the gluten. What develops the gluten is hydration, the water. The, the, uh, 
the glutenin and the gliadin are finding each other, they're bonding, they're creating the gluten threads, and then what kneading does, or mixing, is it organizes the gluten. It kind of causes it to kind of form a weave and create a tapestry that becomes the matrix that can trap the carbon dioxide and allow the dough to rise later. <laughs> so what we're, you know, so by not overmixing the dough or mixing the dough continuously, we can get a, a less organized gluten structure, which is a good thing for hearth breads like this because we want larger holes. And so the, the less structure we have, the kind of bigger air pockets we can get. So that's a trick. And then while the dough's sitting here, the bonding is continuing to take place. So when I do the next stretch and fold, it would be as if I'd been mixing it for, for you know, a couple of minutes anyway. It will have that same effect in terms of strengthening the dough. So that's one facet. So flavor, obviously, is key. This, this would be a pointless exercise, even if the bread is more nutritious, if it didn't also taste good or taste better. Because people, in the end, flavor still rules. That's the flavor rule. Flavor rules. Um, but, and nutrition is only, get, can get you one tasting. And then you've got you've to wow them with flavor, or you've lost them. Um, so, but, but nutrition, the, the best part of this is, is that it, we believe, at least the evidence is showing, that it is a more nutritious way of consuming the grain, the wheat. We, we know that there are challenges with wheat. Uh, aside from the gluten and the FODMAPs, you know, it's, there are people with sensitivities where the anecdotal evidence, because this is still so new, is that some people are able to tolerate this uh, the way that they can tolerate spelt or other kinds of ancient strains of wheat. This performs, even though it's not an ancient strain, it's just a high quality organic, high protein wheat. Um, so the, we're seeing that there's a lot of benefits, but here's what the researchers from uh, uh, Arden have, and I know there's folks from Arden here today, so uh, I, I think we're going to be able to maybe, we'll put, I'm going to send this, forward this on uh, to Cindy, and it'll be part of that packet that can be available with, with all the other handouts. But this is just an extract from here. The, the researchers at Arden who put this position paper together said, uh, sprouting has been reported to increase key nutrients in grains, including antioxidants, tocopherols, thiamine, vitamin B1, riboflavin, vitamin B2, panathenic acid, vitamin B3, biotin, which is B7, folate, B9, and fiber by 1.5 to 3.8 times in the germinated seeds. So, so somehow germinating it, it increases the, the, if not the amount, at least the availability uh, in a measurable fashion of these nutrients. In addition, sprouting grains may reduce anti-nutrients, um, such as phytic acids and trypsin, and trypsin inhibitors, because sprouting increases native phytase activity in seeds. Phytic acid blends with important minerals such as calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc, making them insoluble and unavailable as nutrients. I'm reading this because I just got this, like on the, I read it on the plane coming here. I just arrived the day I left. Um, phytic acid also chelates niacin, making it unavailable for absorption in the body. Trypsin inhibitors reduce the bioavailability of severe micronutrients in both humans and animals. Um, as a result, proponents of sprouted grains insist that grains that have just begun sprouting, straddling the line between a seed and a new plant in a dormant stage, provide all the health benefits of, a whole, of whole grains while being more readily digestible. It sounds like a win-win to me, especially if, the, if it comes through on flavor. So let's take another look at this dough. I don't have a watch. How much, do I have a, uh, how much time do I have before you should take questions? About now? How <laughs> time? All right, I'm getting, I'm going, so, so we'll, do a, we'll do a stretch and fold here. We call it the stretch and fold. We'll do one more of these. So just stretch it and fold it. Again, I'm gonna, and, I, and, and what we found in, in sort of developing this method of stretch and fold, that for the most part, and not in all breads, but in many breads, four seems to be the optimal number. And again, look how much firmer this dough is. I can lift this one, it's starting to feel like it's developing. It probably still has a very weak gluten matrix because it's been still only about five minutes since we started uh, you know, mixing. If I do it the third, by the third one, which maybe we'll do one you know, while we're doing q and A, I I can do a third one. And by the fourth one, we should have a dough that feels like a dough. At the beginning, it felt like kind of like a ciabatta dough. By the end, it will feel like a baguette dough. It'll have sort of the, because the, it's absorbing the water, the gluten is starting to wrap itself around. The, the water and uh, the dough is changing and smoothing out. Um, and so we're not really mixing a lot. 
And um, so I, it's just, to me, it's kind of magical to watch that happen. Uh, with, with a focaccia dough or, a, or even a, a, a ciabatta dough, we start with at about 100%. This was 90% hydration, 100% hydration, and it kind of pours on the table. But then with these stretch and folds, and without the use of added flour, the dough comes together and it starts to feel like a more traditional uh, flour like them. Um, so we've got the, the, nutri the nutrition, we've got the, the, um, uh, the method is very, very simple. The availability of the ingredients is getting there now. The wheat is certainly is now available in mo almost all natural markets. And I'm, uh, we have a local market where I live called Harris Teeter. It's on the shelves there now. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before it will be on all the shelves. The, um, the grains that, that uh, you taste, the cornbread recipe, I'm not going to demonstrate. That was 100% corn flour, half, 50% the fine corn, 50% uh, that, the, grit, the grit grind because uh, when I wrote the book, she didn't have the grits. She only had the fat fine, so I wrote it that way. And then the grits came, and I like the texture of that. It kind of gives a little crunch factor. But the idea there with the sprouted corn is, again, evoking the full potential of flavor in the grain. The sprouting really brings back the full corn flavor. All that was in that, though, was, uh, was some eggs, uh, the corn flour. No, it was, no, was uh, gluten-free, no wheat, although you could put other grains in there if you want. It had um, salt baking powder, baking soda, and a little bit of sugar. And the sugar's optional. I made it northern style. I'm a, I'm a Yankee, so you know I did it the sweet style. When I do it down in Charlotte, I have to do it without sugar, or I get yelled at, because uh, they, they call it Yankee cornbread down there when I do it. Um, but it works either way. And again, the, and, you still, and the sweetness of the corn comes through. But the idea is that that corn is not probably, it's an organically grown corn, but it's not heirloom corn. It's not, it's not Anson Mills corn, which is like makes the best grits imaginable, this tastes like Anson Mills grits because of the method, because of the process of sprouting, um, which I think find, you know, to me that's my benchmark of great grits. And this, this matches it without having to go, you know, for the, the, the rarefied heirloom strains that, that uh, Glenn Roberts comes up with. So there's, there's, I see a lot of potential here, and this is really what all I really wanted to, to bring to you was the idea that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and potential, and it's, I believe it's only going to get bigger. There's just too many positives in all of this uh, for it to, to not turn into the next big thing. And that's what I'm predicting, is this is going to be the next big thing. And, 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 and just as last year, I think the, the buzzword of the year was probiotics. I think that this year, one of the buzzwords of this coming year is going to be prebiotics. Uh, and and uh, whole grain breads, uh, whole grain breads themselves, once you bake them, are no longer probiotic, but a properly made, a high fiber pro, uh, whole grain bread like this, where you've retained all the fiber, becomes a prebiotic, meaning that it becomes food for your micro, what is it, microbiome, you know, for your, for your own gut, for your gut. And, and I think we're going to start to see a lot of um, studies coming out showing the benefits of prebiotics. and, and uh, and so in the book, we cover some of the things like that. But this, was the, this is really the heart and soul of it, and I wanted to, to show that to you. So with that, I will take some questions. And while we're doing it, I'll give another stretch and fold to the dough. Does somebody have any? This won't be the first one, the first one where questions? nobody comes up. Yeah. Anybody come up to the microphone with questions? Nancy? How was the cornbread, by the way? Did, did, the taste, did you taste the corn? Did the corn flavor come? There was a little butter. There's butter in the corn. That's one thing that's in there. Because you have to have butter in the cornbread. I am very interested because we actually do a sprouted spelt that we do, like you have um, said, for over 20 years where we dry it and make it into a flour. But um, so I'm hoping that what I've learned is incorrect, that once you bake um, a sprouted bread, you lose the benefits of the sprouting except for the breakdown of the enzymes. That's a good question, and, I'm, and I don't have the answer. I've had the same question, is how much of the uh, nutritional improvement uh, survives the baking process? And I think we need, we're, it's so new that we don't have real studies on that. We know what, it, what it's like going into the oven, you know, what the values are going into the oven. We don't know what the values are. At least I haven't seen a study yet that shows, that proves the values coming out. I'm, I know not all the vitamin C that goes into the oven is going to come out of the oven and, and, and serve as vitamin C in your body, but we know that going in, there's like at least twice to three times as much vitamin C and vitamin B produced 
by the sprouting process, how much becomes nutritional for us, time will tell. But um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why you know eating sprouts as a vegetable, letting the sprout go longer, and and eating it as a food is is you're getting the maximum nutrition from it that way. Uh, the process for the sprouting is that you you soak it overnight. They 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 rinse it off real well. Then they just keep it hydrated, like misted with with water as they tumble it to keep it from sitting in water. And then within 24 hours, it will shoot out a tiny little sprout. And if you were going for wheatgrass or if you were going for a vegetable, you just let the sprout keep going. But what they do is as soon as the sprout splits, they call it the antenna stage, as soon as it splits a little bit, that's when they stop it. And they take it to drying rooms and they just blow lots of air on, on screens across it to, to um, you know, drive off the moisture. And it takes approximately 24 hours in these drying rooms to get it hard as, hard as the original wheat. Uh, and that's the whole spreading. After that, it's treated just like wheat. It's milled, it's collected. They, uh, I know that at Two Year Health, they use stone mills. They do it slow and easy. And uh, it's about, you know, they treat it with as much respect as you can possibly treat it. Could you use vital wheat gluten to make it bigger? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and you can, and that's why there, there are, there's, the Whole Foods is making sprouted wheat breads now using the flour. And they, the one here in, in Boston uses some vital wheat gluten to get a, more volume. Uh, and that, that's strictly a choice they made because they wanted a larger you know, volume in their loaf. Um, there's um, there's uh, other uh, ways of using sprouted grains. Uh, Chad Robertson in the Tartine book talks about using them as an ingredient, sprouting the grains, like, as almost like a soaker, letting them soften through the sprouting process, and then putting them in the bread whole, or just grinding them up a little bit and make it, letting them be ingredients. And I've been working on one lately where I use sprouted rice and I cook it down into a porridge and then add that back into the dough and it's spectacular. So there's lots of variations on a theme, but, but wheat gluten is always an option. I just you know, felt like I wanted to try doing it without, it's like flying without a net, you know, doing it that way. I'm going to have some very quick questions right. here and quick answers too. Um, I want to see you turn that dough again because my question has to do with, is it, is it just when you use the sprouted wheat flour that you don't no. need, or is this no, generally with, with whole wheat? Almost, I'm doing that with almost all any any doughs that are wet to begin with, like that, where I want to get more hydration in. Rather than I mean, rather than mix, just let the, mix and mix and mix, or let my machine go on and on and on, I'm using this method instead, and I can do other things during the intervals. And the intervals could be anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes. In bakeries, they they'll do sometimes 45 minute intervals between the folds to stretch out. The fermentation, but with the sprouted, you don't you don't need those long intervals. And then you then you're going to let it ferment for several hours, and it. Well, it this will one rise. because it's 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 just commercial yeast, and it's really primed and ready to go. This dough will double in size in well at room temperature in about 90 minutes. Wow! It's kind of like the old Betty Crocker recipes, you know. It's like 90 minutes, shape it in less than an hour, it's ready to go into the oven. Yeah. So so that so that would be my last. I just did my fourth stretch and fold. So at that point. I put it back in the bowl, cover it, and let it go into its first rise. One final question. So that was really good. I'd like to make it my operation. I'm going to need to make probably 15 loaves. Can I use the machine real quick? Or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it? This, is just, this is just sort of a, a trick. You, know? you can definitely do it by machine, and, uh, and you can mix it longer in the machine if you want. And note that you do have the recipes for both of these breads in your book. And on the Whole Grains website, under Find Whole Grains, there's also sources of how you can get um, the To Your Health sprouted grains from mail order, too. So try this at home. You often say, don't try this at home. But we say, try this at home. All right, we are so glad. Let's give Peter a big hand Thanks. for that delicious introduction. I'm just going to cut the rest of it up and leave it here for you to have. Okay.